Now, how many of you have ever had experience with fence sitters on your land or a land that you've hunted where you have a neighboring hunter and they're right on that fence? You know, a lot of times they have the right to be there. They can legally be there. And I'll go through some extremes. You know, I had up in the UP of Michigan, we had tens of thousands of public land acres around us. And I had someone sitting on the public land and putting his bait pile downhill on my land. And it was a quick conversation, you know, just uh, you can hunt here. You have a legal right to sit there. Don't put your bait on my land. But if you shoot a deer and it runs on my land, you're setting yourself up for failure and for a problem. So he moved 200 yards back, ended up getting to know him for the next 10 years, helped him track deer. He was colorblind, celebrated when he did shoot a deer, ended up being a good relationship. I've had experience with a client where they have a big blind on the side of their 20 acres. They only have 20 acres. And neighbor put a big blind there with windows facing his land and he could only shoot. So the steps went up on the neighbor's land. You look out the windows on my client land, could only shoot on his land. He was pretty upset. What he actually did was before opening day of gun season, he went out there in the middle of the night with a ladder and he stretched blue tarp all the way around that blind on his side, on his trees, tacked him to the tree so the guy couldn't see anything else but blue line. Um, we've had that in the past in the thumb area back in the 90s where um, blinds facing onto our property, literally a new open blind. They weren't even on their land, so we just stretched caution tape, no trespassing, yellow ribbon in front of them. So they got the picture in the morning when they came out. Um, a lot of times you can't find that person. You don't know where they're at. Everyone has their fence sitting story and it can be a pain in the butt. Here are five ways that I find that you can ward off fence sitters and the negative effects that they can have on your land. In the first one, the number one that's really important, should be accessing most of the time along your borders anyways. A lot of times when you're setting up your land, especially on private land, you're setting up your habitat improvements to take advantage of your neighbor's hunting pressure. It does you no good to access in the middle of your property. Or I've had clients access 50 to 100 yards away on a quarter mile border effectively giving the neighbor five to ten acres of land that they didn't hunt because they didn't want to go by the neighbor access right along your border that helps a lot of times with fence sitters make sure it's a great access something you can go right along your border and then that helps you maximize the acres especially on a small property and make your land more efficient your efforts number two add a dummy stand or add a stand right in that location a blind Put it right on that location. Maybe that seems a little aggressive, but kind of tit for tat, they're there, you just calmly put it there. That's not a bad way to let them know, hey, I might be hunting here too. You have every right to hunt there, just like them. And it could be that you do hunt there and they do hunt there, who cares? Um, again, I don't care if someone's stand is on the border, I'm not gonna tell them they have to move it. Public land's a little bit different, especially when they have a bait pile on your land especially when windows are looking towards your land then then there deserves to be a conversation about some of those things but really in the end if they have a legal right to be there then you know these are more tactics that you can do to ward off the effects of that person i just want to tell you about an event i'm really excited about it's with uh, chris b from chris b archery you can check him out but he and I are going to have a Q and A session at La Crosse Archery in La Crosse, Wisconsin on July 27th from five to seven. There's a registration fee. There's a limited amount of seating in, inside, but you can still register and you can register, watch on Facebook Live and that registration will allow you to be thrown into the pot for a raffle of some great products that a lot of our, both of our, our uh, partners and list of partners that put together so that we can raise money for Camp Kicking Bear and you'll be entered into that. There's over $4,000 in products from Matthews Bow, Access Trail Cameras, First Light Clothing and on down the list, Hunt Wise, Hunt Cast Giveaway, Hunter Safety Systems. There's, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to list anymore because I'm going to forget them but uh, we have some great product that that registration fee will get you into and if you can't make it in person we hope you can attend on the Facebook Live that we're going to uh, perform. And again, that'll be on Monday, July 27th from 5 to 7 p.m. We hope to see you online or hope to see you in person. Can't wait and uh, we're gonna have a fun time. Again, that's with myself and Chris B from Chris B Archery. So add access, add a standard blind where they can look at it and say, hey, might, someone might be hunting there. When we first hunted our first year down in uh, Wisconsin, 2002, it was on new land. We didn't know what kind of borders we had, neighbors. We'd met a few of our neighbors 
Uh, but we really just didn't know in the end. And we ended up having a pretty bad neighbor on one side. We actually took a couple stumps. We wrapped an orange vest around them, stuffed with leaves. And then we put a hat on top of the orange stump and stuck a big black stick out. And literally from 50 yards away, it looked spooky in the brush because it looked like someone was sitting there on the edge of our border on a stump. Did that in a couple borders. We also put a dummy stand up in a tree. Did kind of the same thing with a hat attached to the top of the tree stand. Big stick, orange vest. We actually had a neighbor there tell us, hey, I thought you guys were in that tree the whole morning. I thought someone was sitting over that stand. I finally looked through my scope and no one was there. So a little, little scary in that respect that they would have potentially scoped us out if we were a person, if we were sitting there. But not a bad way, even putting some orange in a blind. 15th of Michigan, November, opening day of gun season, 13th. Just put a little orange in the window so they think someone's there. Number three, wide access. I love wide access routes because not only can your neighbors see that you might drive by at any time, you might walk by at any time because it's a definite road. Deer definitely know the difference between wide access roads and little just footpaths through the woods that wind around big trees. They'll often use those during the daylight hours because they fit their ingredients needed for access and their daylight movement as far as it being a one to two foot wide trail, branches are cut out of the way and they can easily access through. But wide enough for an ATV, straight so you can see 100 yards down it or more, maybe wide enough for a pickup truck, that is perfect for letting a neighbor know that you mean business right here, you're going to use this access, you're gonna use this main access, and oh, by the way, the deer will stay off during the daylight because it's a wide access. Great tactic, not only for neighbors, but for deer hunting. Habitat positioning. If the neighbor's on your line and you're adding a stand, you're adding an access, you're widening that access, we'll make sure it's right next, not next, it's right, it's not right next to a food plot. The food plots are the worst thing to put on a border where you have heavy hunting pressure. Don't ever get upset that a neighbor is messing up your hunt when you put a food plot on your border and they're hunting 40 yards away across the border taking movement that goes on and off their property. That's just the way it's gonna be if you do that. So that means the opposite is true. A lot of times when you look at habitat improvements and I'm assessing a balance, if it definitely isn't appropriate for a food source, it's probably definitely appropriate, very likely that it's good for heavy cover, screening cover, screening access, but the opposite of food. It's you're making your land more secure in that location. Making sure that food is on the opposite side, the opposite side from your heaviest hunting pressure where your fence sitters on your, are on your land. For example, food here. You know, in this case, somewhere in this range as opposed to a food source here, here, or here. You don't want to set yourself up for a problem. By keeping your food on one side, and even if you have bedding areas here, in these locations and their extension of quality cover where deer can feel comfortable going back and forth through here, then when you have those food sources in, or these uh, bedding areas in this location, what that sets up is a depth of cover where you might be able to sit and hunt between two bedding areas back here. Neighbor can't even see where you're hunting. You're using your access. You're 50, 80 yards off your line. You're looking into a movement between two bedding areas. You're getting there in the morning. And because you've located that food on the other side away from hunting pressure, that allows you to get in the morning. And oh, by the way, when your neighbor is accessing his stand, coming through here, they're not coming from your land to get to that stand. Typically, they're coming across their land to get to that stand. So if you're grading heavy bedding cover, screening, access, good access for use, you're not spooking deer along that line. Those deer will feel comfortable getting onto your land, immediately slowing down and slowly absorbing into your property instead of running all the way through. Again, think about that. The neighbor's coming from outside your land to your border not the other way around. They just push deer, and if deer are feeding on a food source and that's their afternoon food source movement every day that's defined and you have quality food and cover, what I find is even if those bucks are on your neighbor's fringes, they're going to actually pull closer to the afternoon food source movement as the amount of pressure from the outside increases because that's their all important movement of the day, the biggest factor and habitat feature they're going to. They don't want to miss out on that afternoon food source movement. That's what defines where they bed, where they travel, where bucks travel downwind to bedding areas that relate to that food source. 
it sets the established pattern of movement every single day. That's why food plots, you have to have food plots on private land. Bottom line, when all else fails, remember, this is neighborly. Whether you go and talk to the person, that's always the great first step is just say, hey, I just want to let you know I'm going to be accessing along this line. And they might even say, I've had clients just in last week. You know, the neighbor said, I've been hunting there for decades. I'm going to keep hunting there and you shouldn't access there. And here's somebody who just bought new, new land, a 40 acre parcel. I definitely encourage you to make sure you don't give in because you didn't buy 40 acres to only hunt 30 because you want to give your neighbor 10 because they have an established stand along their border. Maybe you're that generous, I'm not. Land costs too much, you have too much invested. Go talk to them, see how it works out, be kind. But number five, when all else fails, kill them with kindness. I say, you have the access, it's a wide access, you might even have a stand there, you position your habitat appropriately. So not a real bad thing, they're sitting on your border, opening day gun season, go in there early, Maybe even leave them some coffee and donuts or just simply give them some coffee and donuts while you're walking by. Have a good chat with them. Be neighborly. Let them know that you care and that you don't mind them sitting right there. And hopefully they don't mind you being neighborly, stopping and have a little breakfast on the way out to the stand. Maybe I'm being a little bit sarcastic with that, but at the same time, not a bad technique to where you could just leave some coffee for them literally some donuts at the deer stand. You just reach over the line, go to your stand, kill them with kindness. There's a lot of ways that you can combat fence sitters. Those are my top five. I don't encourage you to be overly aggressive with the tarps, maybe even the caution tape like my brother and I did a long time ago. But there are always ways to not only ward off the effects of fence sitters and the impact that they have but actually turn it into a neighborly chat, chance to get to know your neighbor and even use their pressure and their access methods and the fact that they're right on your border. You're either doubling up the, the hunting pressure because you're matching their pressure with yours. You're not going in 100 yards in and making your, your uh, land inefficient, but you're using their pressure to your advantage to push deer into the core area of your property and then you position your habitat to make those deer go from the inside of your property out and onto your neighbors after dark. Always great ways to make sure that you can work with fence setters. Doesn't have to be a problem. And these are my top five ways that you can use this fall. Well, if you made it to the end of this video, you're obviously interested in white-tail habitat solutions, what I have to teach, and you will love my new web class series. The first one is how to design your whitetail property. It's out now. The link is in the description. I invite you to check it out. It's on my website. Can't wait to hear about it.